A E S. It's in the joint. Sorry, had to get that out of my chest, but we're back. We're back from AES TMJ conference in Chicago. I also went to Midwinter, and this episode will summarize mine and Mahmood's trip to somewhere where we had long to go for so long, the American Equilibration Society. Now, this society likes to be called AES because it, we've kind of moved away from the whole equilibration thing. It's more, it's way more than equilibration. It is occlusion. It is TMJ. It is the definitive conference that, that brings together all these occlusal characters Camps. And I tell you guys, I was in heaven, I was in education heaven, and I was also in food coma heaven. So join me and Mahmood on this like on the field kind of different podcast, gain a sense of the magic of the AES 2024 conference. You'll kind of feel like your presence was there. And of course, I'll share at least one key lesson per lecture. As well as uh, some interviews from the amazing Patrice Rati and mentors that I met, like I shook hands with John Coyce and Frank Spear within an hour and I didn't even wash my hands. So how did this trip begin? Well, it began with what we call level one permission. Now, uh, I joke about this level one permission whenever we organize a trip, like last year, a few years ago, Porto. This year, we're going to Sicily in June for Verdi preps. Uh, and of course, for Chicago, I needed level one permission. So people ask me on Facebook, what is level one permission? Okay, level one permission is when you have to ask your spouse if you can go. I know that sounds really weak, but it's a reality. When you're father of two boys, young boys, uh, I had to absolutely beg Sim to let me go to Chicago. I'm so thankful. Me and Mahmood were both thankful to our wives for letting us go. So Mahmood's got three kids. I've got two kids, both young families. And we had to beg our families to let us go so that we can follow our passion and attend our first AES conference. I mean, the lineup was just amazing. Like John Coyce, Frank Spear on the same day. Are you kidding me? It was absolutely insane to just be in their presence. And obviously, uh, the president this year was Dr. Jim McKee, who's been a previous guest on the podcast. And I also got to see Bobby Sutton. Now, if you remember from that episode with Bobby Supple, I kind of promised him that I would come to AES and I didn't know when it would be, but I did promise him that I would come. I've been wanting to come to AES every year and I've got a small child, but 2025 is a really cool date that I can uh, earmark to my wife and, and really just build this. What, it's 2021 now? I'm going to keep whispering every every few nights, every few weeks. Okay, uh, 2025, AES, 2025, AES. So, so there we are. It finally happened. And also it was really nice to see an old friend and mentor, Dr. Michael Melkers. That guy has taught me so much about occlusion splint so it was just great to catch up with Michael again we'll be hearing a little bit later how Michael made our trip very special when it comes to hot dogs and oysters I actually had oysters for the first time and they weren't just any oysters they were very fancy oysters and so thanks so much Dr. Michael Mokers for allowing me to have oysters for the first time ever and experience the traditional Chicago hot dog So we arrived to Chicago from London Heathrow and we were just amazed at the architectural beauty of Chicago. It also seemed like a a melting pot of different cultures. So as as a city, we loved it. I mean, it was mostly the conference that we attended and we didn't get to explore as much as we'd like. But from what we saw of Chicago, it was a pretty awesome place. So the theme of the conference this year, AES 2024, was clinical excellence through interdisciplinary care. And this was the 69th meeting that they had. So the way the AES actually started was A, with a prayer, which is pretty cool. Uh, And then secondly, there were some flag bearers and I got to uh, bear the flag of Mexico, which is pretty cool. And as we're bearing these flags to represent where all the delegates who've attended AES are from, so loads of different countries attended, I've got Mexico flag, we're walking in and we've got bagpipers. So these bagpipers are marching in and we're behind with the flags and everyone's like standing and clapping as is happening. And this was very different. I've never seen a conference start like that. We then had the first lecture. The first lecture was a global view of diagnosis and treatment planning. This is by Dr. J. William Robbins and James F. Otten. Now, this was a fantastic lecture. Now, I'm not going to be here and say that every single lecture was fantastic. I'm not going to do that to you. I'll give you the learning points. And I'll be honest that some lectures, as always, in a conference out of the, I don't know, 12 lectures or how many there were, were sensational and others were maybe not my cup of tea, right? And that's how conferences work, right? But this one was right up there. This system that these two lecturers have developed is actually well known. There's actually a book. It's called Global Diagnosis, A New Vision of Dental Diagnosis and Treatment Planning. It's by J. William Robbins and Jeff Rouse. And if anyone wants a good resource for treatment planning and having like a a global view, then I think this will really fit the bill. I think the main takeaway that I could share with you was the following. You know how when we plan a case, we like to start 
from the incisal edges, like the upper central incisors, where they sit in the face will, will really determine the rest of the upper incisors and the aesthetics. And once you determine that, you can determine the opposing. But Dr. Robbins argued actually perhaps we give too much emphasis to the incisal edge and we need to give more emphasis to the upper incisor gingival margin. So the gingival margins of the upper incisors. Because this then gives you a periodontal diagnosis. So for example, gummy smile, vertical maxillary excess, or something called altered passive eruption, whereby the gums didn't mature and they didn't receive seed to the CEJ. So that's what another cause of a gummy smile. And they had a whole system that they shared about how to diagnose and what are the different options to treat. And I think it's a really great one for anyone early in their career to really get a landscape of treatment planning and diagnosis. The second lecture was called Diagnostic Records in the Digital Practice. This was by Dr. Seth Atkins. What a clever, clever man. Like at the moment I'm, I'm scanning, but that's as far as digital as I've gone. I'd like to do more like, you know, printing and designing, but I haven't quite got onto that. But what Dr. Atkins was showing was absolutely brilliant at the cutting edge of digital dentistry. My biggest thing that I enjoyed the most from this lecture was just seeing the 3D printed mock-up as an overlay that goes in the teeth and how they really can look fantastic and how far the printing has come to allow us to do that. So next time you have a situation where you want to do like a, a mock-up, it can be 3D printed. So speak to your lab and work alongside your lab to work on the digital design to be able to create some sort of a mock-up that you can give your patient like this instant smile to assess. Like traditionally we'd use like luck attempt a pro temp and a putty but with digital dentistry and printing there's a neater and quicker way then it was the break and every break i was able to catch up with colleagues who attended the conference and i went into like interview mode i just wanted to ask questions and just be a sponge and gain from their wisdom and knowledge and also hear about the experience of attending aes all these years for example dr chuck fisher has been attending aes for 40 years let's hear it from him can these conferences perhaps be a bit dogmatic that's what i asked him uh, Chuck Fisher. I'm from outside of Denver, Colorado. Um, I've been coming to AES for probably 40 plus years. And um, I find out one of the best meetings I can go to. Um, not only the information that we got, but the experience with colleagues from all over the world. Uh, it's just an amazing time. Thanks. And, and why do you think there is perhaps this perception that inclusion conferences can be very dogmatic? What would you say to someone who perhaps has that view? Um, I'd say you have to come and watch the dialogues that occur with uh, opposing views. Um, and that's the way we learn is we're challenged by other people that think I see a different perspective and it makes us stronger on ours or we have to change. What I'm looking forward to today is... Uh, the debate that's going to be happening later, which I think we need more of. We need more debate and dialogue about different ways of managing a condition. You bet. Now that's We learn from each other and we have to have dialogue. We have to have confrontation. It's very much the, the case here in a nice way and it's very collaborative. So I'm, I'm, I'm very stoked to be here, actually. Me too. Amazing. We're on the same boat. The next person I got to meet was an oral facial pain specialist, Dr. Glenn Kidder. Now, I actually have his photo in some of my slides uh, with a quote that he says. And I'll explain what the quote is in a moment. But it was so nice to meet this genuine man. And what I liked uh, the way our discussion went is when you speak to oral facial pain specialists, they'll argue that actually the occlusion isn't so important. Like, you know, In terms of pain and TMD, we know that the link between occlusion and TMD isn't established. And I know that's going to offend some people. Like one of my mentors, Rob Kirstein, he's, he's the other way and I, I respect him. Whereas Whereas others will be like, nope, there's no evidence at all that occlusion and TMD are linked. Now, you'll see from my uh, discussion, very sh brief discussion with uh, Dr. Glenn Kidder, that he, he likes to see both sides of the coin. So let's hear what he has to say. I just want to say thank you so much for inspiring me. You don't know this, but uh, I, I, I do some talks on occlusion. And one of the slides I put up has your photo on it. Oh. And, I, and I put the following quote. Okay, It's uh, the way teeth come together, occlusion is important. Mm -hmm. The way they function is more important. But the most important is for how long, how they function. That's exactly and, right. Th and I love that quote. So just, can, can, do you mind just spending a minute just explaining, just for the younger colleagues out there, just a little bit more about that? And, 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 and is that something that you picked up? Or is that something that you sort of sat down and philosophized over? Where did that come from? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I have over 5,000 hours of CE, so I'm not sure where that came from. But I have an occlusion background through Panky and Dawson. But... On the other hand, I'm uh, board certified in oral facial pain, so I respect the science. And uh, 
So most people in that field would say occlusion is not particularly important, and I like to see both sides of that equation. So sometimes I think the, the side that doesn't think occlusion is important thinks more of exactly how the teeth fit. But you can have a you can have a perfect occlusion and still have a lot of symptoms if you're clenching and grinding a lot. Now, on the other hand, you can have a terrible occlusion if you don't clench and grind a lot. It may not be an issue. So every case is different. So we have to do indiv individualized treatment plans, and we can't we need to come up with a diagnosis. But uh, I think occlusion is important, and I do respect that. I think you need to fit right look right and fit right to work right however if you clench and grind it's a major factor brilliant and uh, I, I saw you earlier with the, your grand grandchild mm -hmm. that's my grandson uh, uh, adorable and that was real that was really nice to see that uh, at a dental conference for you to have that so is, is, do you bring family often to the conference no I, uh, my oldest son the, and her and her uh, mother are both dentists and uh, they are uh, they, they know uh, Michelle Lee, who asked her to come to this meeting, and they've been here a couple of times before, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm happy that they're here and they're enjoying the course. Great. I'd like to encourage uh, the, the listeners and watchers to consider coming to AES one day. And I, I've been wait, wait, waiting for years for this moment so to be here. Uh, I had to beg my wife to let me. We've got two young boys. I had to beg my wife to be here. So, Sam, thanks so much. Uh, <laughs> I've been here about 40 times. Okay, And, and so this is the theme. It's a, great, it's a great meeting. And I always leave here with a little bit of a knot in my stomach feeling there's just so much more to learn. i got to keep learning. So it's a great meeting to come to. Just quickly then, um, some young colleagues may be concerned, or some colleagues may be concerned that perhaps occlusion conferences could be dogmatic. What would you have to say to them about the AES with regards to that? I think we keep a very open mind. I, don't, I didn't see any dogma here this morning. In fact, just the opposite. Uh, I think we keep very open minds. We look at the whole patient and we look from airway to aesthetics to occlusion to so many factors uh, involved. I, I think we do a pretty good job at looking at the whole patient. And you get a great representation from all the, the big occlusion bodies. You know, you got Coist, Dawson, Panky, you know, they're all coming together. To, so. to, 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 to discuss such a, a, a topic that's so close to our hearts. Uh, final thing then, what's your top advice for a new graduate, a young dentist? In, in anything in dentistry, it could be patient relationship, it could be a clinical tip, anything you think. Just to keep learning. Never feel like you know it all. Uh, again, uh, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Uh, personally, I have a little bias toward the Panky Institute because I think they teach things in a, in a cool way, a, a lot of hands-on stuff. The and, human stuff that you guys cover, and, and, uh, which is famous. go yeah. there to learn more about the technical, they end up uh, learning more about how to be a better person. And about themselves and, as well. And, uh, and so that's an important thing as you develop your, not just your practice, but your family and your community. So that's a cool place. My first exposure to occlusion through uh, my old principal, Hap Gill, uh, who's a, a, a proud Panky uh, alumni, uh, was, was, yeah, was a Panky and some of the things that he passed on to me. So uh, shout out to the Panky Institute there. Thanks so much, Dr. Kidder. I, I, it was honestly an absolute pleasure to meet you. So after the break, there was a lecture on TM joint imaging from an orthopedic perspective. This was radiologist Dr. Tom Preddy and Dr. Jim McKee presenting together. The main takeaways here was they were going over the Piper classification system and actually had an episode with Dr. Jim McKee all about the Piper classification. Funny story, I was standing next to Dr. Mark Piper who had an epic moustache and it was just amazing to be in his presence. This is the magic of conferences just like this. I was very excited to be standing next to one of the most eminent TMJ surgeons in the world. Anyway, the main takeaway that I could pass on to you from this um, TMJ imaging lecture is twofold. One is that maybe centric relation isn't a thing anymore. Maybe centric relation isn't the preferred term. Uh, that we are now preferring FSCP. Can you think of what FSCP stands for? Okay, full marks if you said fully seated condylar position. Listen, I don't make the rules, but I'm happy to play along. It makes sense. Let's go with it, okay? So FSCP is in, central relation is out. And the other main overarching theme of this was that we need to be wary of the occlusion that develops because of a change at the joint level. So as Dr. Jim McKee said in our episode, actually, think not about how the occlusion influences the joints. Think how the joints influence the occlusion. So, for example, the loss of the disc over the joint may mean that you develop an anterior open bite. So as the condyles potentially uh, seat further and they go superior and posterior maybe, this would manifest as a change in the dental occlusion. And so to keep in mind when you experience a, a change in the occlusion that perhaps the joint imaging will help to validate your diagnosis. The lecture after that was adopting a top-down security and privacy strategy. So basically this was by someone called Rex Lee and the long and short of it is that we're all 
royally screwed. Whether you're on iOS, Android, they're all selling our data all the time and we're constantly at risk of being hacked. And if you have a smartphone like we all do, then we're in a pretty crap situation. And, and to be honest with you, I got a little bit depressed and, and I didn't know what the conclusions were. So um, I think the guy was doing a great job in raising awareness, uh, but it was very, very sad to know that we're all screwed. So after a lunch break, we had a phenomenal lecture by Dr. Michael Gunson, who's a, a California-based oral surgeon. Now in the UK, we have a specialty called oral surgery and we have a separate specialty called uh, oral and maxillofacial surgery. For the, for the latter, you need to do dentistry and medicine. Now, uh, I learned that in the States, they just have oral surgeon and oral surgeon is like, you know, they are like max max, they are all encompassing. And so this chap was a very charismatic oral surgeon. I loved his lecture. And basically the top takeaway here is the importance of a lip seal. Now, firstly, he started his lecture by saying that it's absolutely BS that occlusion is not linked to TFD. He strongly believes that there is a link. And then he went on to say about assessing the interlabial gap, i.e. the gap between your upper lip and lower lip, i.e. it just shouldn't exist. When we close our mouth together, our, our lips should come together first and then our teeth should come together. And you really emphasize that lips being apart is very pathological. And if we think about uh, breathing, eating and communicating, these are all uh, vital for survival and all need to achieve some sort of a lip seal at certain points. And what he said was that the brain will sacrifice all other things to achieve this. So as long as the brain can continue to breathe, eat, and communicate, then everything else is relevant. So sometimes if you think about how much effort the patient who's got incompetent lips is doing, how much extra work the facial musculature must be putting in to allow the lips to form a seal could be a significant player in temporomandibular disorder. So that was a fantastic lecture uh, about the lips, which are the way our smiles are framed. And, you know, it really gave me a, a heightened importance when I'm assessing smiles and taking that lip in repose photo to really make sure that this is not overlooked. Now, following Dr. Michael Gunson, oral surgeon. It was followed by two more oral surgeons. So remember, the interdisciplinary element of the conference is now in full force. Now we had Dr. Reza Moverhead and also Dr. Brian Shah, also you know, very talented surgeons. Now a lot of the stuff they were saying was surgery based and it was like, wow, this is really fascinating and you guys are amazing for the surgery that you do. But it wasn't applicable on Monday morning for me, but it was really, really interesting. It was interesting, inspiring. Some of the like general takeaways. Well, I look at this guy, Dr. Reza Moverhead, and this guy is like a phenomenal artist. He's a musician physician, he's an oral surgeon. So really, if you want it all, you can have it all. And then we had Dr. Brian Shah talk about all these algorithms of when to do a total joint replacement versus discectomy. But the most tangible thing I can pass on to you from these lectures is who is the most acceptable? Which patient is most acceptable to perhaps needing surgery in the future? And it's that patient with the small condyles. It was a common theme amongst surgeons that if you've got small condyles, that automatically puts you at further risk of having a breakdown and potentially needing surgery in the future for a TMD issue. And they all had these um, scenarios they were describing, you know, the patient with a nine, a bag of nine different splints and eventually they come and see the surgeon and they need the, the total joint replacement. But, I, you know, it was, it was one thing that was perhaps missing was some key guidelines for us dentists, some key guidelines of, you know, what at what point should we stop bothering with occlusal appliances and conservative care uh, and perhaps where early intervention, early surgery may have benefited the patient. So I think that element maybe could have been discussed, but, you know, I was in all of the amazing surgeries they were doing and what is possible out there is always important to get exposure of this kind of stuff. So that marked the end of day one. And so day two, you know, I interviewed my mood in the morning. We were super, super excited. Today was a big day. My mood, it is the big day. John Coys, Frank Spear. What are you thinking, man? So uh, let me tell you a, a little story. When I was younger, Planet Hollywood opened in Dubai in the early 90s. You know, you've heard of Planet Hollywood, right? No, so it's like, a, it's a restaurant that's sponsored by a lot of A-list celebrities, usually, and they come to the opening. We were standing there outside in the heat, and one of my friends managed to grab and hug Sylvester Stallone. Like, he was giggling like a little girl when that happened. And I just looked at him, I was like, calm down, dude. You're going to have to control me today. <laughs> and then stop me doing that when I see one of those two. I'm going to fanboy so hard. I'm really, really, really excited. It's really excited. Okay, tough question. Team Spear or Team Coys? Uh, um, I think I've probably had a lot more influence on me by Spear's teachings. Um, so I'll have to go Team Spear. Shame on you. It's like making yourself a child. I know, I know. Well, you weren't going to let me get away without giving you an answer, were you? Oh, you never know. <laughs> so day two of AES. Absolute superstars today. Uh, John Coyce, Frank Spear, today with you. But one thing I'm actually really excited for today is the panel discussion. 
the theme is like, how would you treat this on Monday morning? And they're talking about disc displacement, something we see all the time. We can, we can all diagnose it in a way. But actually, the management of it, TMD is like the Wild West, right? So yesterday, we saw some surgery and stuff, but today is a real applicable stuff. Let's go and check some people out. So the 8.15 a.m. lecture was by Dr. Domingo Martin. I think he's part of the face group. I mean, this is from memory, which is like this group of orthodontists who are very knowledgeable on occlusion. I know what you're thinking. What, orthodontist? Occlusion? It can't be, it can't be true. <laughs> well, these guys are actually working in the fully seated condylar position, which is a great point, right? Like if you're doing a full mouth rehab in enamel, which is essentially what orthodontics is, perhaps we should be choosing to work to a fully seated condylar position. And this was exactly what this lecture was about and he showed some cases and in a high percentage of cases Dr. Martin would actually give these patients a splint an orthotic to wear 24-7 for some time to completely deprogram them and find their first point of contact in the fully seated condylar position and they can repeatedly bite there and then do the orthodontics in that position so really now what you've done is you've built the teeth around where the joints are the most stable so that was really cool to see I'd heard a lot about Domingo Martin but it was first time to see his lecture and uh, he was he was hilarious there's one thing he said right um He's, he was talking about relapse and he was saying about the importance of the inter-incisal angle and actually getting the joints in the right place, getting the teeth in the right place, um, that relapse may be mitigated. And he, what he says to his patient is, look, relapse will happen. You know, one to two millimeters, just be grateful that you're still alive. And honestly, that got the biggest laugh for the conference and it just really put everything into perspective, I guess. We then had a, a periodontist lecturing. So the occlusion was a uh, occlusion TMD from the periodontist perspective. This was Dr. George uh, Mandelaris and the, the key key takeaway, the key notes I have from his lecture is, is a takeaway, no recession, no problem. This, this theory needs to change, right? So just because you don't have recession doesn't mean there isn't a problem. If you've got a thin bi-type and thin bone and the teeth are being pushed orthodontically out of the bony, bony envelope, just because you don't see recession doesn't mean there's a big problem. The teeth are essentially walking off a cliff. And so in the susceptible individual before orthodontics, it's important to, to liaise with your periodontist. And he was showing some really uh, you know, advanced perio things, which I am not familiar with, but he he seemed very intelligent and it was really cool surgery what he was doing so more power to you god bless you sir and he also echoed uh, saying he said small condyles big problems then at the break i was able to catch up with some more producerati i was able to catch up with the committee member dr matt standridge and i presented a hoodie to dr colleen sheev now she's on the protrusive guidance app and it's great to have her there and funny story about colleen right she found me because she basically went on youtube and she typed in occlusion and she found me right uh, and then she found the episode i did with dr corey foran on uh, collaboration and then she came to London to do Corey's course. Obviously, it was brilliant. Uh, and so she went back and I, I sort of messaged her saying, hey, Colleen, you live in Chicago. Um, are you coming to the AES? And bless her, she was so honest with me. She, she was like, uh, I had to go away and Google what AES was. And it was great that actually that led to her coming to AES. And it was great to meet Colleen there. I wanted to give her a hoodie. And also, you know, she, she was just a lovely, lovely person. She really embodies everything uh, Protrusive is about. She's nice and geeky. Uh, and actually, she, she gave me some great parenting tips. And so you'll hear how I uh, give her a hoodie to celebrate her. So Matt, we just met. It's great to meet you. Uh, do you. Do you come every year? Your committee? Okay, your committee. Yes. Okay, amazing. Okay. So how long have you been involved with AES for? For AES, um, my first meeting uh, was about eight years ago. Uh -huh. And I've, been, I've made most of them since. It's been a great, uh, great organization to get involved with. And then uh, just this year, they asked me to... Uh, um, get involved as industry relations chair. And so this is my first year doing that. And so, so you're responsible for, for all this? Well, I will be next year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. the, the, the vibe is brilliant. I'm absolutely loving it so far. Thank you. What message could you give to Patricia Rati and then those who are always maybe considering it but haven't never made the plunge? You know, if I had to give an elevator pitch, I would say it's the best two-day clinical comprehensive meeting in the world. I mean, yeah. you know, you have all of these uh, thought leaders from all of the great occlusion camps and world leader worldwide, and they bring them together and they may have some disagreements, but we have a central philosophy around function and stability. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just something that's not talked about enough. So you'll never, you won't find another two day meeting like this. Do you think there's an element of dogma involved? I would say a lot less than probably it used to be. Now I'm so, I'm fairly a young blood with this, so I'm sure it was a lot more dogmatic before. But I would say um, things have been opened up a lot more within the last ten years. I would say and incorporating multiple um, different thought processes and from different camps and stuff. And it's it's amalgamated a lot more than probably what it used to be. Amazing. Well, thanks for for, for being part of this. I look forward to seeing you next year. Hopefully, thank as well. you.
Um, last question. And this may not make the podcast because I'm, I'm debating whether this is kosher or not. Uh, team Spear or Team Koist? What's that? Team Spear or Team Koist? Oh, I love both. Uh, <laughs> I've, been through, I've been through a lot of Spear and I'm currently going through Koist. Okay, so I love that. Uh, I love that answer. So yeah, yeah, I love both, but yeah. If we had to pick one. <laughs> so right now, what I, I will say this. I would say um, Koist's treatment planning way of doing things and how structured it is and almost like systematic how it is, I would say that that really um, put some light bulbs off in my head. Like it really connected some things. I love it. I, I feel, I, I agree. His stuff is amazing. Thank you so much. Thank I'm going to hand the mic over to Colleen now. Okay, Colleen. Yeah. It's been so... It will make me look more professional if you're sitting next to me. It's been so you're nice like, to oh, see you here. like, oh, now she's trustworthy. <laughs> As a producer, Rati, it was great yes. to have you here, right? Uh, and so I wanted to just give you this hoodie. I wanted to get, make sure you have a, a protrusive hoodie, basically. <laughs> So while you open the hoodie, I'm going to tell um, the producer a little, a little bit about you, Colleen, just having met you and stuff and right. you're on the podcast. And I asked you on the old app, on the forum, like, are you coming? And yeah. you had a look into it. It's actually always just down the road from me. Which so I'm, I'm, I'm going to come. Really easy. Uh, and, uh, I love how you're getting stuck in. I love you getting stuck in. Amazing. Okay, good. Um, and it's been so nice to meet you here. And I had a really nice conversation with you yesterday. And I'm just inspired by, by, by you as a, as a learner, but also, you know, you've got three kids, three kids. Yeah. Uh, and then we discussed about how there's a season of, of learning and season of life. And sometimes... Oh. Uh, there are other priorities and learning is not number one priority. And then and now your kids are age of a patch, but you can go back into it and stuff. You look great. Um, amazing. So good. Okay. I love how you just got stuck in. This is brilliant. Okay. Josh, you can do us a 12. Do us a 12 now. <laughs> okay. But, um, it was just great to learn about you as a, as a, as a, as a business owner, a practice owner, a, a dentist, a parent. Um, what advice would you give to women in dentistry who are, Mums who are aspiring practice owners, how, 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 and, and, and those who want to aspire to go to CE classes and stuff, what advice would you give to them? I think, uh, what I am learning and coming to grips with is that there is no balance. So stop searching for it, right? Um, their life is always a lot. And so, you know, you try to find the good parts in each part that you are. And what I am coming back to is finding Colleen. I had lost Colleen for a while, right? So your doctor and your boss and your wife and your mom and your daughter. And I had lost a sense of self. So it was a very purposeful kind of chat in your own head of like who you are and what things make you happy. And then you bring that part of you into all of those other relationships. And I don't, I mean, I feel better all the time. So I'm going to call that successful, right? And so I think we all have a different sense of what success yeah. is. Certainly in the US, right? Monetary is usually yeah. at the top of that list, but that's not necessarily true, right? I have a lot of friends who are incredibly financially successful. Um, but then they'll talk about these simple things like, oh, I played catch with my kids. And this is the beauty of life. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, I like my kids and they don't drive me insane and I like my patients and I like my team. And so to that, I suppose that's successful for me. Amazing. It was really nice to, to get some parenting tips from you last night. Well, the, the story you told me last night, I will never forget that. So I uh, thank you for making me a better parent after, after yesterday. So it's it amazing. It's by far my favorite job. It is. I mean, just, yeah, raising tiny people is yeah. amazing. They, they teach me as mm -hmm. well. So any, anything you want to say while you're on the podcast to the Patricerati? Oh my gosh. Keep watching, learn about the joint and, you know, how to create everything into that proper function. But yeah, I mean, I will definitely keep watching. Amazing. <laughs> so, where has your occlusion journey taken you? Cause like, you've done a bit of training with Lucas Lashman, you've done Panky, you're here now. Um, do you ever feel that because you've been exposed to a few different teachings that perhaps it's gone? confusing for you and it says you made the topic uh less tangible occlusion's kind of uh a, a mystique of its own isn't it and uh and it, it's like a it perceived to be a dark art and particularly i think the main reason why is because it gets confused in, in dental schools between departments and we always think in a very departmentalized way don't we so you have surgeons who are talking about anatomy and they typically within their department will tell you about the physiology of how the joint works and all the rest of it but truthfully do they know how the dysfunction of the joint works when it relates to the occlusion and the teeth when they meet in the middle well usually because of their training less like less than you might imagine and, uh, you remember back in uh, university in, as an undergrad in Sheffield, we had the restorative tutors teaching us about occlusion. Did they know anything about joints? Probably not, realistically. I mean, yesterday was a testament to that. We, we had a whole lecture about uh, joint-based occlusion. So yeah. the occlusion as a consequence of the joint. 
So yeah. the, the, the disc slip, and then that changes the occlusion. Yeah. And actually what we see is a class two, but actually they were a class one, yeah. 12 year old, but yeah. it's because of the, the, the disc injury. And as a result of that journey of just discovery of all of these pieces of the puzzle fitting together, I don't think you can ever know enough. And so, so my journey, um, of why I bolted on the things that I did at the time was almost by accident. Hanky became a kind of an extension of the work that I did when I lived out in Australia and worked out there for a couple of years. And the dentists out there were comprehensively minded dentists and that was the work they were doing. And they went, well, you, you can't go anywhere without having the, the, the bedrock of occlusion underneath you. So go to Panky or go to Spear or go to Dawson or something. And, and to be honest with you, a lot of it was to do with, I was just exploring and following the world and sort of following my, my nose and seeing where the, life took me, you know? And then it can get confusing when you then bolt other things onto it. But when you really, and like people like Lucas Lashman, for example, you listen to his stuff and he's brilliant at formulating his patchwork quilt and explaining why he ascribes, it's quite a strong word, but kind of like why he's taught, he's tied these aspects of Dawsonology into it and why he uses a, a Koisty programmer as opposed to a Panky programmer and, and things like that. When you go, okay, fair play, I, I kind of get where he's coming from. Um, quick, 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 quick one, Team Spear or Team Kois? <laughs> should, should we make this like a big old... I think on one side of the audience is going to be half and then on the other side of it is still be half and then I think they'll split them down the middle and they'll, they'll be. I'm hoping there's going to be a fight at some point today so I'll probably sit right on the fence. Um, Don't be a coward. Don't be a coward. Do I have to wear any of their uh, uh, like subscribe devices? <laughs> is that what we have to do today? I have to wear a coisty programmer all day? We can arrange that. To be fair, I do have a little bit of choice. Pick one, Mickey. So after a break, having spoken to Matt and given the hoodie to Colleen, uh, there's a really cool panel, like it was a case study, um, three perspectives uh, on a patient who had basically a disc displacement. It was Dr. Lynn Lipskis, Dr. Leanne Brady, who I adore, absolutely adore. What a wonderful woman. I've been following her blog for years. Fantastic educator. Uh, and Dr. Peter Lemieux. I probably said that really wrong. I'm so sorry, Dr. Peter Lemieux. Lemieux? Lemieux. Lemieux. God damn, I wish I was listening to when they pronounce his surname. Anyway, a uh, really cool guy, very cool headed. Anyway, fantastic uh, panel discussion. Uh, I wish we went more into treatment. I wish, I mean, that thing could have been a whole, that panel discussion could have been a whole day. I would have loved to delve deeper into treatment strategies, but it was basically about how they assess and diagnose such a patient. My biggest takeaway I want to give you from that lecture is, of course, Dr. Leanne Brady, right? Her, her saying is, Talk your think. Just a wonderful thing. I'm a big fan of showing your working out. Like when I've got a, a tough case, uh, I'm I'm very happy to show my working out with my patient. I'm saying, hmm, you know what? So here's what it could be because X, Y, and Z. But also, we must also consider uh, A, B, and C. And I obviously, stay away from jargon. I make it in patient-friendly terms. But just talking your think and you know saying what you see and just having that open and honest relationship with your patient is fantastic. And so that was a real communication gem to highlight. So after this lecture, Dr. Michael Melkers surprise us with these Chicago style hot dogs which are amazing I almost said donuts there Chicago style hot dogs which are absolutely fantastic better than five guys and I just want to say thank you again Michael for oysters the hot dogs everything it was a real culinary experience so now what you've been waiting for right so it was uh, next up was John Coyce and Frank Spear not together separately okay uh, so first was uh, Dr. John Coyce with his colleague Dr. Marta Ravila Leon now this lady gosh she's so clever so she is like the authority uh, on like uh, face scanning and digital dentistry and how precise these um, digital articulator systems and motion trackers are basically and so she's the authority on that so basically what they were talking about is the old face bow traditional face bone articulator and how in, in John Coyce's own words you know the days of the articulator are numbered why because now with the advent of you know face scanning and digital articulators and different ways to transfer that information digitally now is so good and the way it's heading is that articulators are going to be dead Right? I mean, of course, there'll always be niche uses, uses of them, but a bit like the digital scanners that we have today, you know, your trios, your iteros, etc., your medits. Year by year, the number of impressions being taken are less and less, and it's going to be the same with articulators and face bows. And, and so that was the main takeaway of that, that articulators are going to get phased down. He didn't say exactly when, but, I, you know, me and Mahmoud are having a chat, and uh, he had some cool things to say. In fact, let's listen to what Mahmoud had to say about that lecture. So before I share Mahmoud's reflections on this, I'm going to just tell you about um, Frank Spears' lecture. Uh, again, it was so great to see these two giants one after the other and I was just 
starstruck. I was in awe. These guys have taught me so much. And so just like from John's lecture about articulators being phased out, the takeaway from Frank Spears lecture, which was basically about TMD and the prosthodontist perspective, a good reflection to share from a Frank Spears lecture is that most patients are not in central relation. We, we know this already. Most patients have some degree of slide. And so maybe it's not the presence of the slide that's an issue. It's perhaps the degree of the slide. So if someone's got a severe slide, we know in the literature that that is correlated with TMD and facial pain. Now, we don't know whether that's because perhaps the joints change and that's what causes a slide. And that could be like a confining factor here. But essentially, I like his common sense approach. And the quote he said was, having a patient know where to close is more important than the pinpoint CR position. Let me say that again. Having a patient know where to close is more important than a pinpoint centric relation position. So I like the fact that Frank Spear is not so bogged down like some clinicians are about it has to be fully seated condylar position. And we heard some of that at the conference and that there's a degree of uh, biological variability or a bit of fudge in the system. Okay, Mahmoud, we are in Chicago, midwinter, yes. waiting for the midwinter shuttle. How awesome was yesterday? It's absolutely incredible. John Coyce, Frank Spear at the same place. Yeah, it was, it was so eye-opening. I also we, love the contrast between the two. Go on. You know? so tell us more. I mean, firstly, we totally fangirled them both. I haven't washed my hands since. Yeah. <laughs> Got to take both our hands, which is pretty special. Yeah, and we got the selfies. And we got the selfies. And, uh, yeah. and we squirted uh, chili in, uh, you squirted chili in uh, Mike's face. In my Mike's face. Yeah. Uh, Michael Melko's massive shout out to him. He's looked after us so well. He you know, helped us to introduce us to all these superstars that we're just in absolute awe. So huge shout out to someone who's uh, taught us so much and inspired us, actually. Yeah, you made this really, really unforgettable. So thanks so much. Entire committee, actually. We were in this yeah, room yeah. with all the uh, AES members and the amount of hard work that goes into it was, it was super obvious. So for next year, guys, AES 2025, please do show your support to help a society like this that really is like the main one for comprehensive care. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's doing all the right things, isn't it? Uh, it puts you in an environment where you can really meet people from all sorts. Uh, they're all interested in the same thing of doing like absolutely amazing sort of high quality dentistry. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the quality of the content was mind blowing. Tell, tell us about some of the, the, the younger colleagues listening. Like sometimes I get this question like, Jazz, what, what do you mean? What is comprehensive care? What does that mean? What does that mean to you? Comprehensive care really um, kind of means you just got to look at the patient as a whole. So, you know, you're, you, a patient might present to you complaining that they've got a broken tooth or some pain, but you got to step back and to take a look at the bigger picture because things aren't always, you know, uh, obvious. And, and the, the best way to serve that patient is always necessarily just fix that one tooth and off they go. Step back, have a look at, you know, the, 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 they're always talking about, I mean, the heavy focus was on looking at the joints um, because there might be a, a bit of a, I don't want to say paradigm shift, but we are starting to learn um, and really appreciate the effect the joint has on the rest of the teeth and the occlusion, how things come together. As, as Jim McKee said on the podcast, when he came on my podcast, uh, and it was just great to see him. He hosted so well. Uh, he said that we used to think that, how, we used to think about how the occlusion affects a TMJ, but really what you should be thinking is how is a TMJ and the, the, the malhealth of it, um, the maladaptation of it affect the occlusion, which is really my eye-opening once you think of it that way. Now, yeah. back to the thing about comprehensive care, I just want to say uh, my, the way I see comprehensive care very simply is there used to be a time where dentists would just treat caries only, right? Hundreds of years, you know, caries, mm -hmm. take teeth out, that was it. Then it was like, okay, we need to now look at caries and perio. And then I was like, okay, caries, perio, mouth cancer. And now really the, the next level is, okay, look at their diet, look at their um, joint health, their look breathing. at their masticatory system, their breathing. That is a comprehensive dentist. And that doesn't happen like a shortcut overnight because dental school doesn't prepare us for that. So this is where societies like the AES really come into play. Yeah, they open your eyes and then they help you, you know, guide you through the process of acquiring the knowledge you need to be able to implement it. And honestly, implement it. I mean, they're always there to help you figure out a way to put it into your own working environment. You know, we know that not everybody can dedicate 90 minutes to their first patient exam or whatever it is. And so especially when you're younger, maybe you don't own your own clinic. But there's a, you know, if you just tweak one thing at a time, like, for so example, you can do. like if you're at the moment, if you don't palpate the masters, but, but I know we bang on about this, right? Yeah, yeah. Just one thing that you do, for example, at the moment, if you don't make a diagnosis list, a yeah. simple thing, like how many dentists do you know who just yeah. don't make a list of diagnoses? Right, yeah. just make a diagnosis list and go for it, and keep adding to to to, to your sort of um, comprehensive exam. Eventually, you get comfortable in your shoes to be able to to make better diagnoses, better diagnoses, and better care. And uh, every time you add something, you get good at it. It frees up a little bit more of your mind to add the next thing, and then it all becomes routine.
So it can't, it can't just be done in, in, in one day. So no. it, it's, no, it's a beautiful not. thing. Now, just before the shuttle comes, what was your top takeaway from John Coy's? I, I can't pronounce that lady's name. She was brilliant, Spanish lady. Um, John Coy's. Marta. Uh, Marta? Marta. Well, her surname, I forgot, but yeah, Marta, Marta, she was brilliant. You know, John Coy's the way he introduced says like she is a fourth, fourth yeah. of nature, I think that's what she said. Yeah, yeah. How much she's done in this field of digital dentistry already is fantastic. Yeah. What was your main, just describe to those who weren't there what it was about and what your main takeaway was. So it was about where digital was going or, or where it is, really. And um, the fact Articulate that... Articulators are dead. So, of course, made that clear. So you, anyone who's, who's, you who's heard... Yeah, I mean, you know, anyone who's heard me speak knows how much I love some of the traditional articulators, face bows, etc. And uh, the reason I love them is because they were there to do a job, right? They were making our work more predictable. And then I think they'll still have a place in certain areas, but, but the way to get more accurate records and do this uh, in a more predictable way is certainly digital and that's here and she's doing all the hard work behind the scenes of testing okay so the rest of the show today is basically uh, me and Mahmood at the Chicago Midwinter Conference which was cool like it was a downer compared to the magic of the AES like how could something compete with what we'd just seen but it was nice it was nice to be in Chicago and good vibes and good food and some of the cool things I'm going to highlight to you in this uh, in this podcast is the coolest thing that I saw at Midwinter which is called the Halo this is a mirror that I think is releasing next month no financial interest here but uh, apparently it's like a mirror a mouth mirror and an intraoral camera at the same time I mean this is genius and apparently it heats up so it doesn't steam up so take my money kind of thing right like, it, it sounds amazing so I kind of interviewed those guys as the, the most innovative thing I saw at the conference we also caught up with Dr. Alan Mead and finally uh, Mahmood sent me a challenge he sent me a challenge to say composite as the Americans do he sent me a challenge to say composite uh, 10 times so let's count if I was able to achieve this challenge thanks to our good friends at Cosmodent okay so um, we're setting a challenge for jazz he has to interview yeah. the guys at uh, Cosmodent and he has to say the word composite at least five times. Are you ready? Let's do it. All right, wish me luck. Good. Okay, so um, we're talking about your composite okay. range. Um, what makes uh, your composite really exceptional compared to the other composite brands okay. out there? First of all, we're the only company that makes a microfill. Okay. Yes. Better polishability, Is better wear. Well, there's one company, well, there's one other company that makes a microfill. They don't sell a lot of it, but I do it. <laughs> but we're basically, we're the only company that actually physically has it and shows a microfill. Called enamel microfill. Best polishability, Fant better yeah, that, This composite, I've used it before. Really fantastic uh, shine. I mean, I go on the Depeche Farmers course in UK yeah. with their payment. Mm -hmm. They just do it. So good friends of payment. So I've tried this composite for first hand. Really lovely sheen and shine. It gives you better possibility, better trance, uh, better reflexibility for class fives. Uh, gives you better wearability. Gives you better depth of color. It matches the Venus shade guide exactly on the button once it's cured. So it doesn't go darker or lighter. Our hybrids are stronger than anything else on the market. A little bit more opacious. So they black out underlying color better. They also match the Do you guys make... Uh Pink opaque composite as well. Pink opaque is designed, uh, it's a microfill based composite. It's designed to block a dark gray, dark brown metal and, um, upcycling stain. Mm -hmm. It brings the value up on like white, which brings the value up. It brings the, makes things brighter, but brings the value down. Yep. The pink keeps the value up. And so when you put your composite over the top, it gives you the, keeps the chroma, gives some warmth as well. Gives it warmth. Yeah, yeah. We also have our pink composite called Ginger Fill, which is three different colors, light, medium, and dark. It's the only microfill based composite there is. So it has better flex again. So you don't lose it when you're putting it in margins. It holds its polish so it looks wet, like gingival tissue. Unlike the other ones that actually lose their polish and become opaque. Same thing with our microfill. We're talking about renamel microfill. Better flex so you don't lose your margins. It doesn't lose its polish like a hybrid or nanofill. So it doesn't become opaque. That's why you can't see where the composite stops and the two starts. I, I'm, I'm a fan of this composite. So if you haven't used a renamel composite composite before, please do give it a go. Uh, nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you as well. Okay. you of, uh, of dental podcasting. Okay, Alan Mead, how was your day? It was good. It was long. Exhausting because we are doing it in here. How, how many guests did you end up speaking to today? Seven or eight. And that's, that's a lot considering I didn't really have any. I only had two of them scheduled when I got here and I had to turn some away. I feel bad about it. So that's great. It was good. It was that's good. Like two months worth of content right there. Well, it kind of is. Yeah. Like if every podcaster that does this goes, Ooh, this is good. I got I got I can put my feet up in a little while, but not that that ever really happens, but you know. So that was good. Highlight of the day. What, what was one thing that you learned today from speaking to a guest that you want to pass on to the people of Protrusive, who I'm hoping will also tune in to uh, Very Dental Podcast as well? It's a good question. What was my resounding uh, thing? Well, I talked with a hygienist 
about prevention and how I think some dentists, a lot of dentists have kind of given up on prevention. Uh, and by by saying that going, I think we've given up on a lot of people. Maybe dentists care more than people do. Hygienists are more into prevention than dentistry. It's, it was an interesting conversation. I think maybe dentists put prevention off to the hygienist so we can mm-hmm. do and when in reality it needs to be the whole team mm-hmm. it really does and that was a real we talked to i talked to a couple people about that honestly that was one good thing also i got to sit down with david hornbrook which i mean i've, I've podcasted with him before but it's so in person he's just the best i could talk to him for hours so yeah it's very good well we look forward to checking that one out uh, it's just great to see you in the person really honestly. good to see you it's really yeah. cool but hopefully how, another how last have time you liked this meeting is this your first midwinter yeah, first midwinter. Yeah, I mean, the main reason I came was for AES. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Frank Spear, yeah. John Coyce, yeah. uh, Gunson. So they did uh, speak together. They they spoke at the same meeting. How about that? I know, really I know. Cool. We, we never thought it would happen. Yeah. But, but me and Mamu thought, if we don't come this year, Right. Right. With that lineup. Yeah. Uh, so hoping to encourage lots of younger blood all around the world to consider coming to, to meetings like, like mm-hmm. that, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, is AES one that you've ever been to? One that you've Man, I've, I've been to AES adjacent for a long time. I should probably go. Because I know, I mean, I, I know a lot of the Spear guys that go there. And I mean, I, Jason... The, the new president is, I've been friends with him yeah, since dental yeah. you know, for 20 years, you know, so, yeah, yeah. He seems like a really cool guy. Oh, and so he's, very excited. He's, he's, he's a new a president. Good, a good leader. He'll be great. Do you know what he did for his acceptance, like speech? I don't. I don't. He, he was it like, it was a rap. It was a rap. It was like he basically oh, rapped like for five of minutes. Of course, of course he did. There's, I'm not surprised <laughs> by that at all. Yeah. So hopefully again, I'll come again uh, next year for AES, but it was nice to experience midwinter. It's yeah. much, just like everything in America, it's much bigger than everything we have in the UK. Yeah. Uh, well, and the weather has been pretty mild considering midwinter is one of those things where it could be 70 and sunny or 20 below. So yeah, you, yeah. you hit a pretty good time, I think. Yeah, very lucky. John Coy, Frank Spear, and then all the weather. Yeah. Well, and then now we got to meet you as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> nice to meet you. This Thank you great. so much. Thank you. Okay, guys, we've just arrived at Heathrow from a fantastic trip. I've lost my voice still. Uh, major jet lag once again. Uh, but just want to sign off with a couple of things. Firstly, about um, John Coyce's lecture. We didn't get to reflect on that because I posted on Instagram about the death of articulators. I, I was at the whip mix stand um, at the Chicago Midwinter. I posted a story and you guys were like, whoa, what the hell? Like, what is, what's going on? Our articulator is really dead. And I don't care the fact that I'm in a tunnel and you can't see me. You guys can hear me, right? So that's the most important thing. Our articulator is dead. Then I also want to just sign off by just the experience that we've had in Chicago. So firstly, um, Mahmoud, you were paying more attention in that lecture than I was. This is your, uh, your, your bag, right? Like it was, I was mesmerized by John Coyce. But as soon as they were talking about all the mud jaw and the face scanning, I'll apply this Monday morning. Because uh, you love your articulator. You stroke your articulator to bed. So uh, for you, this was like a, a, a big deal. So um, what were the main summaries or takeaways from that lesson that led me to say on Instagram that this could be, the, 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 you know, as John Coy says, the days of the articulator are numbered. So, I mean, hi, everybody. So we've just got off of like an hour of flight. So excuse me if I'm a little bit incoherent. But I would like to, first of all, say that I slightly disagree with uh, John Coyce, which is a big statement for me, because I still think analog will always, at least for me, have a slight advantage, and that is the feel. Now, once some of you may have heard me... I told you guys he strokes his articulate. I I do. So uh, we can talk about that another time. However, what they were talking about, essentially with digital, right, we can all scan arches, right? You can get the arches scanned and digitized, and then you can put them into a digital articulator on whatever software you want. The problem's always been, how do you orient or orientate the arches on the articulator so they best represent how they are in the patient? And the... So essentially, the, the, the problem, just for the younger colleagues, is how can we replicate the patient and their movements, whichever way we do it, whether it's traditional or, or digital, how can we make the patient's head on a plate? When you do an analog, a Facebook is a good way to do it, right? It relates the upper arch to the condyle. But the problem is there was no digital Facebook. Getting the digital uh, scans onto the digital articulator usually is just random. But then some people started using photographs, right? You take a digital photograph, make sure you can see the entire sort of upper arch, whether, you know, use retractors or not. And then you rely on the technician's ability to orientate a 3D digital scan using a 2D photo and trying to get, you know, the AP position, the anterior position, uh, anterior posterior position, line, the lateral line, line, line everything up. So the beautiful, the beautiful thing was that the Coist group, they did a lot of research and they compared using a photo versus using a 3D face scan. And what they found was overall using the face scan was more accurate, although it depended a lot on the quality of your scan. So if you had a crappy face scanner, you were going to get crappy results. Get a good face scanner, you'll get better results than using just a photo. And the results could vary in terms of error 
between like half a millimeter to up to six millimeters, which is insane. But obviously what she kept on sort of getting back to is the gold standard seems to be the, the draw trackers. Okay, the draw trackers are, are going to be the gold standard, like the, like the Mojo, and there's a few other ones out there. And, and you know, competition will always breed uh, better results and bring the hopefully the prices down eventually for people like us to be able to use them. Uh, but the cool thing was the the Kois scan body, which essentially turned a little, you know, the, the Kois platform that you can use on the dental facial analyzer, which some of you may have seen us talk about, it turns that into a, sort of a digital version of itself. The outside of it can then be scanned and that can help you orientate the upper scan onto your digital articulator. And that's kind of the latest. And that's what they're working. Okay, so where, where are we headed in the next five years? Think? Uh, yeah, I think ultimately the majority of the work is going to be digital where you're you're going to scan uh, the arches, you're going to scan your bite record, whether that's an open record or not. Uh, you're going to take a digital Facebook of some sort. Now, whether that's going to involve high quality facial scans or one of the new scan bodies they were talking about. Yeah. Or ultimately, I mean, some people probably just jump straight onto the mod show. And, um, so I mean, so the, the, in terms of hierarchy, if you don't mind me saying, so hierarchy is... Uh, you got the traditional articulators and face bows, okay? That's like what we're used to um, for the bigger cases. And then the next level up from that is a photo, just taking photos and allowing the technician to sort of marry it up. Yep. Then the next level up from that would be face scan, face scan but then assisted by this uh, scan body that Koi's created. That comes with that, right? And then that helps to orientate it. And then the level up from that is something like a module motion tracker. Where essentially, you have all the motions programmed. The problem at the moment is how many labs actually use that. So we were speaking to Chris Orr when we were there. And he was saying about how many labs actually using that at the moment. But that will change in the future. So I think the, the, the summary is the days the articulators are numbered and the photos are not as accurate as we would like. However, we know colleagues that get good results with it and is another option to consider. And it's still better than not using anything, right? And just randomly putting the articulator up in the digital... Yep. Um, sorry, the, the scan up in the digital articulator anywhere or you know, based on average values. The ultimate goal is to save time when it comes to delivery. Uh, no more surprise in terms of cants anteriorly um, and make sure that the occlusion that you prescribe in the wax up will be the occlusion that you get on delivery. And that's essentially the Game of Thrones as you described it. Yeah, right? that's right. Exactly. So where do you want to spend the time? Do you spend it in the planning phase or do you want to spend it in the fitting or you know, adjustment phase? Like choosing your difficult path. Do you want to do the uh, front load it or do you want to do it uh, at the end, basically? So um, brilliant. Well, uh, f let's do a final little reflection then. I personally have had a brilliant time, met so many heroes, so met so many of the Panky group, actually. Um, Leanne Brady, uh, uh, we met John Coyce, Frank Spear. Even though we didn't see them shake hands, we shook their hands within an hour. So technically, we made Coyce and Frank Spear shake hands, technically, yeah, technically yeah. Yeah, which was amazing. The thing is, I, I was so starstruck. I had a story in my head to say to um, Frank, right? I, said, I was going to go up to him and tell him about an ex experience that may or may not involve belly dancing in London. Uh, and I was going to make him laugh, but I completely froze. I was like, oh, my God, I love your work. And now that was it, basically. So, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was so nice. It was so... <laughs> I'm so honored to meet you. He gets that all the time. I want it to be memorable. I was like, hey, about yeah. time you went, the belly dance would happen, Raj, and I was going to tell him the story and stuff. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> next episode, yeah, reflections. Yeah, no, I mean, what a trip, right? Like, I think it was everything we ex wanted it to be and more. You know, big shout out to Mike Milkers again for making a lot of stuff happen. Thank you so much. Uh, the AAS guys, all the guys in the, you know, in that presidential suite talking about how the meeting went and stuff. That was awesome yeah, they're, they're to witness. Really sweet. Yeah, really, like, what a lovely down-to-earth bunch that are just trying to make so the best event that people can really take something away from. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really, really enjoyed meeting everybody there. And, um, yeah, CDS, like, massive, uh, was phenomenal. I was a little bit disappointed. Okay, okay. <laughs> just say it. Just say it. it is what it is, right? Like, like, okay, I'm well, it like massive, though. It was my point. huge, <laughs> so I didn't... like everything in America, but yeah. I don't know. Like, would I have to, would I, if I was just going for the CDS? No, no, I wouldn't go. Like, AES yeah. was, was, the, was, the, was the main cause. Um, and uh, um, CDS was like this uh, cheese plate you get on the side, which, which has yeah. sour grapes. Yeah, which we left uh, too late and got cold. Yeah, but no, it was, uh, what an awesome, awesome trip. Learned a lot, met some amazing people, like yep. literally the world leaders in our industry. Which yeah. was incredible. We're going to get some really cool podcasts uh, this year on occlusion uh, and comprehensive care. So very excited for the for the, all the um, links we made when we're there. So super excited for that. And I, I think for those who would like to experience what we experienced with comprehensive care and um, the, the the level of density that we saw and the inspiration that we got, you know, do consider AES twenty twenty five next year. So I think it's February nineteenth and twentieth. And if you're in the UK or in Europe and you want to get a taste of it, a glimpse of it, then I would highly encourage. Uh, Michael Melkers and Lane Ochi, two of our mentors, coming on, is it July 27, 28, something yeah, like that? Yeah, last, 
weekend. You, you're, you're, you're booked. Yeah. I need to book still. But um, you should totally come for that. You're going to go away a better clinician in terms of communication, planning, comprehensive care. Uh, and if AES and, and going to America is a, is a bit too far from where you are in, in, in your position in life at the moment, like it was for me for many years. So again... Again, shout out to my wife, let me come. Um, then that's a great way to experience some of the magic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's absolutely no point in knowing occlusion inside out when you can't really get to use the fun advanced bits of it because you can't talk to the patients yep. about the issues. That's it. And one last shout out to Zach Kara, our buddy Zach Kara. Um, we got some cool things lined up with communication and developing uh, yourself as a, a, as a communicator, really, to all your patients. And you, know, you can do all the fancy dentistry in the world, but unless you can convey the value to that, the patient, uh, it doesn't matter. So there's some super exciting stuff. Uh, I don't want to reveal too much, but super exciting stuff coming your way, guys. So thanks so much for following our AES 2024 journey. Catch you same time, same place next week. Take care, all. Well, there we have it, guys. A little bit of a different episode. Hope you enjoy that. Hope there are a few lessons in there for you and hope you managed to catch the vibe as almost maybe you felt as though you were there with us at the time. So tune in next year to see if our wives let us go to Chicago once more for AES 2025. I want to say a big thanks to the committee for looking after us as well. Dr. Michael Melkers was brilliant, as we said before, and just generally the magic of the AES. It was just amazing to be there. All the new friends that we made and the Patrice Ranti that we got to meet along the way. Bye for now and see you at a conference near you. Maybe, who knows? Oh, and just a quick shout out to some of the Patrice Ranti that I met in Chicago. James, the prosthodontist from Canada. Gabe as well from Canada. It was great to spend time with you. You had this to say. I found Gabe from Canada uh, and he came over and uh, it was great to see another Patrice Ranti. So, like, like a... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tell me, Gabe, uh, what do you love most about Protrusive? The podcast? Uh, your, your enthusiasm. Honestly, because I think that's the baseline to get anybody to do anything is to show that it could be fun. Otherwise, why are we even bothering? Absolutely. I'm a big fan of the dental enthusiasm to make sure that we constantly remind people that dentistry is, is a good profession to be in. What's brought you to AES? Is your first time? Second time. Second, okay, so what, what brings you back and again and again then? <laughs> I guess um, uh, this is a pretty unique crowd because the people presenting are... World well, class, well did, renowned. The ones who did the research. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's not secondhand, oh, I got this from the actual person presenting. From the, so, from the, from the horse's mouth, I think. From the, the horse's mouth. <laughs> from the horse's mouth, so yeah. Amazing. So, so, so well, is it really yeah. nice to be, Are you a midwinter as well? Uh, not you staying for that? Not okay. Not all right. Well, it's been great to see you. <laughs> any, any. So this doesn't have to make it, but any, uh, anything you want to say to to those on the YouTube and uh, on the protrusive uh, protrusive right out there? Um, keep listening to this guy. <laughs> the enthusiasm it. and try to find that same enthusiasm for yourselves in your practices because I appreciate patients it. feel it. Brilliant. Yeah, they, that's they, true. They do. They, that's true. It, it's genuine. If it comes from the heart, then and the people follow through. And I, I, yeah. I, I love that. And I was telling uh, Gabe today about the the fast modeling technique with bulk composite, and he's already using a, a derivative of that technique. We have we haven't exchanged exactly our protocols, but I look forward to to, to you to listening to that one, and yes. then, and then reply back and say, okay, how, you know, what, how, what are you doing in your practice? So these little geeky things are I like to stay abreast of. Okay. Lean from Chicago. Fozia, always great to see you. Thanks for giving us company over pizza. And Julie from California. Also, Nirav, all the best with the upper aesthetics course that you'll be doing. And really just all the AES committee who are just so warm and welcoming. 